I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 18, where we continue our series in this book. I'll be reading verses 12 through 17 this morning. chapter 18, verses 12 through 17. And uh, while I read, I would invite you, if you were able, to stand with me as a sign of our respect for Scripture. But while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat saying, This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or a vicious crime, O oh Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words and names and your own law, look after it yourselves. I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. And they all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. But Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. This is the word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Would you please be seated? join me in prayer. Lord, we ask that you would meet our need, but more importantly, that you accomplish your purposes in us and through us. In Christ's name we ask, amen. Well, we saw last week as we uh, looked at verses 5 through 11 uh, that Paul has come now to Corinth, which is in the region that Luke identifies here as Achaia. And uh, having been joined by Silas and Timothy, Paul devoted himself completely to uh, the proclamation of the gospel, which we infer to mean that uh, he was freed from his tent-making occupation, and rather than simply addressing the Jews in their synagogue on uh, the seventh day of the week, that presumably he was able to devote himself full-time to uh, ministry. And we see a record here of a Crispus in verse 8, the leader of the synagogue. We'll deal with that in a moment when we get to Sosthenes. But uh, we see that uh, he is, uh, he's moved his center of ministry from uh, uh, where he was before to uh, presumably the home of Nicola and Priscilla, uh, to the home of uh, uh, Titius Justus. Uh, although we think he's still living with Priscilla and Aquila. And we saw at the end of that last passage that Christ appears to Paul and says, don't be afraid that I'm with you. No man will attack you in order to harm you for I have many people in this city. Well, we see the fulfillment of that here in this passage. Of course, uh, Christ did not mean that Paul would not encounter opposition to the gospel. That's true everywhere Paul went. It continues to be true today in one, to one degree or another. Uh, but rather, we understand by this that Christ meant that Paul's work of planting a church in Corinth would be successful. And though it would encounter opposition, that opposition would not win the day as it seemed to have in Berea and Thessalonica and Athens. So we're told at the end of verse 11 that Paul was there a year and six months. 
and the information we know about Gallio, which we'll get to in just a moment, we believe that Paul probably began this phase of his ministry in the summer, late summer or early fall of A.D. 50. Now we're introduced to this character in verse 12, a proconsul named Gallio. Scholars tell us that the Roman Empire was more or less divided into two types of provinces. Now this was new to me. Apparently some of the provinces were governed directly by the Senate. Other provinces were governed directly by the emperor. Uh, senatorial provinces were governed by one of three classes or grades, tiers of uh, magistrates. The praetorum was the first uh, tier, then the proconsul, and then finally the consul was the highest rank in the uh, senatorial uh, provinces. Corinth or Achaia had been a, pro um, had been a senatorial province from 27 BC until AD 15, at which time it was switched over to uh, the imperial administration. And then it went back to being a senatorial province in 44 uh, AD. Uh, proconsuls were given a term of one year. Gallio here was almost certainly, uh, they were always um, installed on the first day of July, at least in the Julian calendar. And uh, so he would have been, we have it on good authority, that he would have been installed on July 1st, AD 51. And uh, so that would put this, and then they served until June the following year. So that would put this uh, event at um, somewhere around between July of 51 and June of 52. Uh, Gallio, uh, we're told, was the son of a well-known Spanish orator named Seneca. And he was the brother of a well-known philosopher named Seneca. His father was a Marcus Aeneas Seneca. He was an orator, a rhetorician. And um, Gallio's birth name was Marcus Aeneas Novatus, meaning the new one, <laughs> or we would in our culture say junior. It was Marcus Aeneas Jr. His brother was Lucius Aeneas Seneca, who was famous for writing philosophical works and plays. Uh, his brother made reference to Gallio. We're going to get to why his name was Gallio in just a moment, but his brother uh, may have been a little bit envious because Gallio, who at the time was Marcus Novatus, uh, apparently was known for his charm. Everyone loved him. In fact, in one of Seneca's writings, he says uh, something to the, I didn't write it verbatim, but he says something to the effect of, no one is as well liked as my brother. <laughs> we hear a little bit of envy there, perhaps, I don't know. But um, for reasons I was not able to ferret out Marcus Novatus moved to Rome and was adopted. So I don't know why he was adopted. Uh, perhaps it was custom for him to be adopted by the one who would train him because he was trained by uh, his adopted father who was a very well-known uh, orator himself uh, named Lucius Junius Gallio. And so Marcus Novatus took on the name of his adopted father, who apparently trained him in the rhetorical arts. Now, the point of all this is that he came from a well-known family that was aristocratic and highly educated. Okay? So this is not a bumpkin here uh, running this, you know, he's only a proconsul and not yet a consul. He was eventually, he did eventually make the rank of consul um, and was eventually assassinated by Nero. Now, his brother, philosopher Seneca, was Nero's advisor. Can you imagine having that job? And uh, Nero eventually made his brother commit suicide. 
He didn't like Galileo's brother, and he says, I, I don't like your advice anymore. I think I'd like you to commit suicide. And so he forced him to commit suicide. And then uh, Galileo at the time was under threat of death and begged for his life. And um, Nero said, okay, I'll spare your life. But then a few years later, he turned up dead. And it was, um, all historians agree, it was Nero's cronies that did it. So this is the Galileo, and we read, we know quite a bit about him. Uh, I'm surprised I didn't know any of those things about him, so it's very interesting to me. Now this Galileo here is running this province. Uh, one of the other philosophers uh, mentions Achaia in his writings and says, calls it a second-rate province. Um, despite Corinth's wealth, it surprised me. I would have thought Corinth would have been a premier location. But um, there were apparently three tiers of provinces, and this is the middle one. Now, Gallio is holding court. Um, the word that's used there for judgment seat is the same word that's used later in the New Testament to describe the judgment seat that Christ will occupy on the Day of Judgment. And it would have been an elevated platform in the marketplace called the Agora there. And so he's holding court. And the Jews in Corinth take an opportunity to do something a little strategic. You may remember that in Berea and Thessalonica, the Jews sought to silence Paul by bringing him before civil authorities, which would have only had the, and did only have, the effect of silencing Paul in those cities. But here, for the first time, the Jews have tried a new tack. They've now taken Paul before the Roman authorities in the hopes of silencing him everywhere he goes. Now, you remember when, when you read through chapters 16 through 18, Paul keeps getting run out of each town. He'll preach, and then some will believe, and then the Jews will gather, the Jews who don't believe the gospel will gather and drive him out of town. But it only works for that town. They have to follow him, as they did from Berea to Thessalonica, and then from Thessalonica to Athens. They have to keep following him around to run him out of the next town. And so uh, now they're saying, if we can get a precedent set, a legal precedent, that what this message Paul is preaching is no longer considered religio-licit, which means a legal religion. It will no longer enjoy the protection of the Roman Empire under Judaism, and we can prevent his teaching anymore. Now, I didn't realize this at the time. Perhaps I was taught at the seminary, and like many things, I'm afraid it went in one ear and out the other, uh, because I have a mind like a steel sieve. <laughs> and I didn't realize that this is kind of a big deal, what happens here. It's kind of a big deal. One commentator says this is the apex of his second missionary journey, this event with Gallio. And the reason it is, is because a legal precedent is being set that will affect Paul's ministry for the next decade. The Roman Empire is not going to um, turn on the Christian faith for another 10 or 12 years. And so, this decision that Gallio is going to make, which is essentially a decision to ignore it, is going to allow the Christian faith to remain under the umbrella of protection that Judaism enjoys. Because Gallio here is essentially, by his ignoring the problem, the disagreement. He's essentially saying, this is an internal matter for you to discuss. And implicitly, Gallio is saying, I still consider whatever this Paul guy says to be part of your Jewish faith. So I didn't realize this is an important legal precedent that's being set that's going to protect the church, not just in Corinth, but everywhere in the empire. So I thought that was kind of neat. 
Um, so he goes on and he says, I'm not going to listen to you. <laughs> Basically. Uh, there is some question as to whether uh, in verse uh, 13, the word law there, is that a reference to Roman law or is that a reference to Jewish law? The text doesn't tell us. From the context, it appears that they're trying to use it in its Roman sense because they're trying to get Paul's message placed under a different category from religio licit to religio illicit. Okay. But later, when Gallio responds in verse 15, and he says, your own law, he uses a different word. There's a different Greek word there indicating that Gallio thinks this is a matter of your own religious dispute. They drove him away. He drove them away from the judgment seat. And so, they all take hold of Sosthenes. There's considerable discussion here in verse 17. Just a couple of more brief comments about this and we'll get to the application. Discussion as to what the antecedent for all is. This text doesn't tell us who is the all. Is it all of the Jews? Or is it all of the bystanders who are not Jewish? The consensus, the commentaries are divided on this. Some commentators say, well, we can't really know. But the other more or less a uh, group of commentators think, well, it's probably the bystanders. This is probably an example of uh, anti-Semitism. And the speculation is that the crowd would have taken advantage of Gallio's dismissal of the Jews as an excuse for him, his driving them away, as an excuse to abuse them uh, without fear of uh, reprisal. Now, interestingly, there is a Sosthenes that's listed in the first verse of first Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians. He's listed as the one who's with Paul as Paul is writing 1 Corinthians. And we learn later, he's Paul's emanuensis. That's just a fancy word of saying that's the one who wrote down what Paul said by dictation. Okay. So, so there is a Sosthenes in Corinth who is writing down what Paul says by dictation. And it's entirely possible, but not certain, that it's the same Sosthenes here, who apparently, if, if this is anti-Semitism, we're told as a leader of the synagogue, has not yet been converted. Now, what about Christmas? Well, one commentator says, well, there are uh, often more than one leader. There's often more than one leader in a synagogue. That's possible. Another possibility is that Crispus has been converted, and so he got kicked out. And so Sosthenes is the new leader of the synagogue. In any event, we're told here Gallio is unconcerned. And Gallio's lack of concern is the form of Christ's protection of the church. I'd like us to consider here that when Christ declared that he would build his church, he made no exceptions. Everything that we read about in the book of Acts is a fulfillment of Christ's declaration that he would build his church. Remember we said when we started the book of Acts that I believe the book of Acts, following my professor who devoted his working life to this book, wrote a commentary on this book, 
that the book of Acts is written apologetically. That is, the primary purpose of the book of Acts is not to give instruction on how to do church. It's not ecclesiastical in nature, primarily didactic, meaning primarily teaching. It's primarily a book to commend the gospel. It's primarily a book to demonstrate how God is moving through his spirit. In chapter 2, that's the whole significance of Pentecost, is that through God's spirit, through the spirit of Christ, now the church is being built. It's a fulfillment of his declaration that he's going to build his church. So I want to consider here how Christ is building his church in this short passage. Well, we can certainly say that Christ will build his church despite opposition. This is certainly not the first place in the book of Acts where we've seen opposition to the gospel. In fact, once we get past uh, the day of Pentecost, there seems to be opposition at just about every turn. First, there's opposition in Jerusalem to the ministries of Peter and John. Peter gets in prison. Right? And even um, opposition to uh, the church there in Jerusalem to the point of Stephen, the first martyr, Stephen the deacon, being killed. And then we find Paul, the one who's the persecutor, now becoming uh, the one who's persecuted. And so we follow Paul as he now takes the gospel. And there are always people who receive the gospel. There's always people who believe. But opposition is usually close on his heels. But Christ is building his church. Now I want you to consider, uh, this morning we talked a little bit about some of the in Sunday school. I was pinch hitting for Brad since he's um, this week he concentrated more on his ordination exams um, and this is what I get for not writing down my prayers I forgot to pray for you I hope I'll remember to pray for you at the end of my sermon but Brad, I would encourage you to come down to Christ the King Church in El Paso Brad's going to do a great job but um, our, our denomination uh, is having some disagreement right now about the matter of sexuality and um, how, how do we handle that? And how do we present what scripture teaches to the culture? How do we commend Christ and the gospel to a culture that rejects, in many cases, the scripture's teaching on, on sexuality? Some of you um, may be very discouraged because you look and you see opposition, not just culturally, uh, to the church, but opposition in many places of the world, the opposition uh, takes a more overt form. Perhaps uh, you see the uh, place where things that were considered uh, commonplace, broadly accepted consensus 50 or 60 or 70 years ago are now things that are reviled, things that are ridiculed, things that are actively opposed in the form of uh, cultural activism. Right? There's, it's not just political activism, it's cultural activism. Right? Because the best way to change politics is to change the culture that is behind the politics. So if you can change the culture, you can get the res political result you want eventually. I suspect that some of you at least are discouraged by the what seems to be the erosion of the influence of the church in our culture. For Christ is building his church despite opposition. I've said this a number of times before, but I hope to encourage you with it again. Despite what you may think about the cultural decline in the United States, that the church is thriving in many places in the world, and even in those places where it's being most actively opposed. And the places where the church is being most actively persecuted are places where the church seems to be thriving and growing at the fastest rate. And even in our culture, where even in our country, where the broader culture seems to be more and more turning away from 
generally accepted biblical ideas, there are people's lives who are being turned around. The gospel is still changing people's lives. Christ is still taking people from where they were and moving them into his kingdom. And it encourages me when I go to Presbytery to hear about what God is doing with not just church plants, but with uh, works that um, various missionaries and people who are laboring out of bounds uh, come and bring reports about. Uh, it encourages me to hear what God is doing in the Navajo Nation with D.H. and Emily Henry. And every time D.H. gets up front, he talks about um, someone he's discipling or someone that his wife is, is counseling and, and or a small group that they're starting or how things are going with their church. It's very encouraging to me. Also, I want you to consider that Christ is building his church despite the rejection of the people in this passage that Christ describes as old wineskins. Do you remember in Matthew's Gospel when Jesus gives the parable of the, of the wineskins? In the immediate context of that passage, the old wineskin is Israel. And specifically, it's the Mosaic Covenant, the strictures of which do not allow for the new wine of the new covenant, the new covenant people of God. Right? Now, I can't speak for you, but in my own limited life experience, I have not seen persecution by the church at the hands of Jews. I grew up in the Bible Belt, so I didn't see crowds of Jews dragging pastors in front of City Hall and trying to get them arrested. But I wonder here if there's a parallel concept. You remember that some years ago I talked about the, uh, the imagery of the seed and the husk, right? The kernel and the, the chaff, right? The wheat and the chaff. The word of God is the kernel, right? The chaff, if you will, the kernel, I'm not going to, the, the shell is the cultural context that the kernel germinates in, right? And so as the gospel goes around the world, the kernel of the gospel germinates in every kind of culture. And while the principle of the kernel remains the same, the scriptures are the same, the gospel is the same, Christ is the same, in every culture, the outworkings of the kernel tend to look a little different depending on the shape of that particular culture. And so here we have people who are rejecting the gospel, who are opposing Paul. People who are rejecting Christ. Sometimes the gospel is, or the work of the gospel can be opposed by people who believe in Christ, but they don't like the, the current, the shape of the, um, of the husk. It's the same kernel, but sometimes the husk is different on the outside. And they don't like the shape of the new husk. The new husk is a different culture, for example. And we find this often in denominations where there's a lot of uh, mission work going on in parts of the country that have different cultures, different demographics, different political leanings, right? And often those church plants or mission churches in different parts of the country have husks that are different. Well, Christ is building his church. And the husks will sometimes look different. Now you'll say, now oh, wait a minute, the devil's in the details, isn't it? How do you know what's kernel and how do you know what's husk? Well, I've got an 18-point message 
uh, devoted to that topic that I'm going to go into right now. That's five minutes after 12. No, I won't go into that. That would be a good topic for a Sunday school quarter, perhaps. How do you distinguish the kernel from the husk? Frankly, I don't have all that figured out myself. But I do know that we can all agree that Scripture is the kernel, right? The gospel is the kernel. Hopefully, we won't fight too much about the husk. All right. And in the context of this passage, I also want you to see that Christ is building his church and does continue to build his church with or without the magistrate. Christ builds his church with or without the magistrate. Now, in this case, God uses, in his providence, he uses the magistrate to allow the church to go forward unhindered, at least for about 10 years before the empire puts the screws on the, on the church again. And it's a tremendous time of growth for the Corinthian church as well as for Paul's mission, continuing missionary activity. But... God can do that without the government. And a word of caution here, if you are someone who's particularly politically minded, I don't consider myself to be particularly politically minded, but if you are particularly politically minded, be careful that you don't rely upon the government to be the means by which the kingdom is propagated. Now, I do believe that the state can protect the church, but the state is not the means by which, the, the immediate means by which the kingdom of God is advanced. At time forbids us to get into the weeds about the relationship between two kingdom theology and uh, the relationship between the church and the state. Um, if you want to read about that, you can read Augustine. <laughs> uh, but I do want to encourage you, if you are of a political persuasion that believes that the state is the enemy, it might be, but it doesn't have to be. And Christ will build his church, whether it is or not. I had lunch with my friend Matt Saloria this past week, and we discussed this very thing. And we were discussing the differences between premillennialism and postmillennialism. Uh, Matt is premillennial. I'm <coughs> probably 51% all of and maybe 49% post <laughs> And so we're discussing whether the state is necessarily the enemy of the church or if it's only the enemy of the church in certain conditions. Well, here, the state, despite being evil, is the friend of the church. But through its neglect, its benign neglect, don't be discouraged. If you're the kind of person that watches Fox News all day, you might be inclined to jump out of your window and run around with your hair on fire and believe that Christ's kingdom is going to come to a screeching halt any minute now. All right? Or, if you are the kind of person who watches CNN, you might think, everything's great. And isn't it wonderful? What a wonderful world we have. And my exhortation to each one of you is the same. Christ's kingdom is going to be built. His church is going to be built. Whether you think that everything in our country is great right now, or whether you think it's a hair's breadth away from Armageddon <laughs> doesn't matter because Christ's church is going to be built. 
one other closing thing. God saved his church and his promise through this neglect of Galileo. He allowed his church to prosper in Acts 18 because he was wanting to glorify himself. God's purpose is still the same. God wants to glorify himself. And some of you may be looking around your circumstances and feeling discouraged and saying, how is God glorifying himself in my life? Where's the purpose in my life? Where is the kingdom advancing? Where's the kingdom growing? Where's, where's the kingdom doing the stuff that I see in the New Testament? Why isn't my life like the book of Acts? Why isn't my community like the book of Acts? Where, where's the book of Acts happening in the world right now? I would just encourage you to remember that sometimes the work of the kingdom is unseen, like that leaven in the lump of dough. And you may think it's not there. You may think that the kingdom stopped growing 50 years ago. And maybe in some places the kingdom is not manifest now where it was 50 years ago. I'm not denying that. But the kingdom is somewhere and the kingdom is growing. And if you're all millennial, you recognize that world history goes through cycles. There's these parallel tracks of good and evil. And sometimes evil seems to have the upper hand, and other times it doesn't. But the kingdom keeps right on going. You don't have to be post-millennial to be encouraged. You can be an optimistic all millennial. Okay? And God can use sinful, selfish pagans like Gallio to advance his purposes in the church. And his church will never fail. Would you join me, please? Father, give us encouragement, we ask, to believe that you are always at work. And give us grace, we pray, to be a part of it. In Christ's name, amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.